And here signing today is Holly May. We appreciate you being here again. This is to bring you up to date. Uh, <clears throat> in short order, I'll be signing a, another executive order that involves some of the areas of uh, recreation and uh, the other activities that have been going on, particularly in the athletic and entertainment areas, as you know, that were covered in the early executive orders and either closed or restricted. And there are a few of those areas that, that are remaining closed or restricted, but these, uh, these are the ones that we will be lifting the restrictions on in the next executive order. And these are found, if you happen to have a copy of that executive order, these are found in section two, the recreational activity, recreational facilities, activities, uh, fields, athletic activities. And there was section E, F, and G. And these are, we, we're opening them as follows. Uh, section E was sports that involve interaction in close proximity to and within less than six feet of another person. Section F is activities that require the use of shared sporting apparatus and equipment. And G, activities on commercial or public playground equipment. Now in the executive audit, we'll have some detail to explain those a little bit to, and add some example. So among those categories of E, F, and G, which are recreational activities and athletic activities, are such things as outdoor youth and adult sports and recreational activities, and they are posted on accelerate.sc.gov's website. Example of those are include but are not limited to such things as American Legion, Little League, Dixie Youth, Travel Team Baseball, Youth and Adult Softball, Kickball, Soccer, Lacrosse, and Flag Football. Now for those and that will go that lifting of those will take place on at 12:01 a.m. on Saturday, May the 30th. Now for those that have organized think, uh, activities like that, of course they can start practicing then, but we want to hold off on competitive play in those things until June the 15th. And those are the recommendations that have been vetted by our team, uh, notably Accelerate SC, and they will be in the executive order. Now, not in the order, but one thing that we never restricted, but we are issuing some guidelines. They'll be on the website, but it will not be in the, the order, are day camps. And those are such things as the YMCA day camps, the vacation Bible schools, church day camps, athletic day camps, educational day camps, and scouting activities, but not overnight scouting activities, but other, other activities. And we'll be opening them uh, after, uh, we're not opening them, but we are putting together guidelines that will be um, available uh, soon. Also, the, doing the following, for entertainment venues and facilities, which we refer to generally as attractions, uh, we are opening opening these. There are section C was arcades, section F or tourist attractions, and that includes museums, aquariums, and planetation planetariums. Section H in the order, indoor children's play areas, with the exception of licensed child childcare facilities. J bingo halls open, and K venues operated by social clubs. The examples of these types of attractions, tourist attractions generally, include large attractions, uh, which are such as the South Carolina Aquarium, Patriots Point, the Riverbanks uh, Zoo and Garden and State Museum, and also smaller attractions include go-kart tracks, miniature golf courses, arcades, uh, laser tag mazes and escape rooms, zip lines, single car amusement rides such as bumper cars, slingshots, reverse bungee rides, ferris wheels, carousels, swing rides, climbing walls, batting cages, pony rides, billiard parlors and pool halls, 
ice skating rinks, roller skating rinks, outdoor, indoor paintball fields, rope courses, and skateboard parks, and also Ferris wheels. But again, the Accelerate SC will have all the recommended uh, guidelines will be posted on the accelerate.sc.gov website. And these facilities that I've just mentioned may return to operations by, uh, on Friday, May the 22nd, 2020. Okay. With that, Dr. Bell. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. DHEC has developed a statewide testing program to gain a better understanding of how COVID-19 infection is among all South Carolinians. And as of yesterday afternoon, a total of 138,238 tests have been performed in South Carolina, covering approximately 2.7% of our population. And of those tests, 9,175 have been positive for an approximate 7% positivity rate of tests performed. In order to begin the safe transition back to a um, less restrictive day-to-day -day life and a quality of life and to um, revitalize our economy, South Carolina has to increase per capita testing to allow us in public health for a more precise idea of disease transmission in communities and an understanding of where interventions may be needed to control spread. This will help us reactivate businesses and community activities more safely. Through our testing plan, our goal is to test 2% of the state's population or approximately 110,000 South Carolinians per month. And we are currently on track to meet that goal by the end of this month. Specifically, our plan focuses on three priority testing areas, universal testing of nursing home residents and staff, expanding testing in under-resourced minority and rural communities, and conducting mass testing in urban areas. To help protect one of our most vulnerable populations, DHEC is, con is conducting a universal testing plan of the approximately 40,000 residents and staff in the state's 194 nursing homes. <clears throat> and we have completed phase one of this testing plan, which included 74 nursing homes, and we're well on our way to reaching our goal of testing all 40,000 residents and staff by the end of this month. As we enhance our testing capacity at our congregate facilities, we also recognize the importance of increasing testing across the state and increasing access to testing, especially for those at greatest risk for severe illness from the disease. To do that, DHEC continues to work with federally qualified health centers, with our healthcare systems, MUSC and PRISMA, and other community partners to expand COVID-19 testing across the state as part of our statewide testing strategy. So far during the month of May, more than 65,000 tests have been conducted at testing sites across the state. And as part of this effort, DHEC and our partners have held 55 mobile testing events. We have scheduled 58 additional mobile testing events, and we continue to add more sites daily. The mobile testing includes the following priority testing events. There are 45 located in under-resourced communities, 56 in areas of high population density. There's one in a, in a tourist location in Myrtle Beach, and there are 11 additional priority events being scheduled. Together with our partners, we currently have a total of 202 testing clinics. And this includes stationary clinics like doctor's offices and hospitals available across our state. As we continue our measured approach to relaxing restrictions. It's important to remember that businesses do not spread the virus. It is people who are spreading the virus. And so um, it is spread by people in their actions or their um, measures to prevent the spread. And so in addition to testing and finding cases, 
We continue to encourage everyone how critical it is to follow the steps to stop the spread of disease to um, make personal choices and take personal responsibility to protect themselves and to prevent spread in the community. All of these measures help us flatten the curve that we're all paying attention to to see how well we are in um, effectively preventing the ongoing spread of COVID-19. So again, these specific measures that we strongly recommend everybody continue to follow is practicing social distancing, remaining six feet apart, avoiding large crowds and large events, in addition to social distancing, it's important to wear a mask while out in public. To follow disinfection recommendations frequently for um, environmental surfaces, and to also practice personal hygiene by regularly washing your hands, especially after you've been in public. And also to monitor for symptoms of illness and um, if there are symptoms of illness, we encourage people to stay home, to avoid group settings, not go to work, keep your children home uh, from group settings, and all of those measures help prevent the spread of disease. As always, for additional information, please visit the DHEC website at scdhec.gov backslash COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bell. Well, as you can tell, we're making progress. And I'll just mention that the way that we approached this back in March was to, rather than setting out the essential and non-essential and trying to list everything, we, we listed those things very carefully, those that, because of the close contact of the crowds, it would be activities or areas that would be uh, conducive to the spread, uh, spread of the virus. But those that have been, had, uh, have not yet had the restrictions listed, or uh, excuse me, lifted. Those that have not had the restrictions lifted, uh, I'll, I'll mention those just to give you an idea how far back along the list we are. And those include entertainment venues and facilities. Those are such things as nightclubs, bowling alleys, concert venues, theaters, auditoriums, and performing art centers and racetracks. Darlington just had a, a race on, on Sunday and. They had to cancel another one because of weather, I think. And I think they will have two either today or, or today or tomorrow. But uh, it was, and by the way, I understand it was viewed by something like uh, close to 7 million people, which is a record. And if, if you happen to see, if you missed it, you can see it online. It's, it's quite exciting. But uh, those, those still have restrictions on them, as do uh, uh, adult entertainment venues and spectator sports. Uh, as I said, uh, of course, Darlington is a, is a racetrack, but also is a spectator sport. But they had the, um, because of the lack of spectators there, they went ahead and also we're gonna have the PGA uh, coming up in, in June and they won't have, uh, they will not have spectators either. Uh, we never closed hotels. We never closed, certainly never closed churches. Uh, a number of things that we did not do that they did in other places. And, if anyone has any questions, I, I would urge them not to look and see what other states did, but contact the Chamber, of the, the State Department of, of Commerce. The State Department of Commerce is one that can give you uh, immediate information on, on the various limitations. Are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. Shona? So tell me about why you decided to open up tourist attractions for this weekend and why it's pretty wide open, why all categories? Well, that was the recommendation, the, the studied recommendation uh, and findings of Accelerate SC. And of course, part of Accelerate SC, uh, you, you're familiar with the membership, uh, that includes all the state agencies, including Parks, Recreation, and Tourism, as well as Department of Health and Environmental Control and everyone concerned. And uh, we, we can't keep things closed forever, of course. Uh, the Constitution doesn't allow it. Uh, neither does common sense and neither would the economy. Uh, public health consists of economic health, physical health, and mental health. And every time you take one action in one of these areas, there's a, another reaction, sometimes unintended consequences in others. So we're mindful of all of those things. This was the time to remove those restrictions. Yes, sir. Governor, you didn't include nightclubs, concert venues, bowling alleys, movie theaters 
Is there anything particular about those types of venues that make it hard to come up with guidelines? There, there, there are a number of things, including the the, con the touching and of the, the facilities, the crowds involved, and also we have not yet received the studied recommendations of Accelerate SC, which includes all the components I mentioned a while ago. When we receive that, then we'll make that decision. That should be very soon. Yes, ma'am. Governor, how proud are you of uh, Darlington at this point, you know, seeing that first race and being able to have others in the future? I think it's just wonderful. And I say again, if if anyone, if you've never been to Darlington, you really ought to go at least once, and you really develop an appreciation for what goes on there. Peggy and I have been a number of times and have been allowed to go down into the infield and meet the drivers, all those Richard Petty and all those famous drivers, and it's really it's it's quite quite something. But it is high tech. It is. Uh, an enormous uh, IT exercise. Everything is has computers. They, I mean, they measure the the temperature on the tires. Everything is being photographed. In fact, you can go online and ride around in the car with them uh, and, and see what it looks like from the driver's point of view. As you can see in front of him, and there are a few women that are driving as well as the men. See behind them. See beside. It is. There's a lot of science as well as uh, skill and, and courage involved. But it's. It's high tech and high power. Those vehicles are eight to 900 horsepower. They get up to 200 miles an hour on the straightaway. It's quite something to see. But to have the first NASCAR race of the season to open in Darlington, South Carolina, on the track too tough to tame, the lady in black, they call her, is, a, is quite something for South Carolina. We're, we're happy to have the first PGA tournament, the Heritage uh, in, in uh, Hilton Head as well, coming in June. Yes, schools are planning to have in-person graduations, 400 students, a few family members per student. We're looking at crowds from 1,500 to 2,000 people in the next few weeks. How concerned are you about those size graduations and gatherings? Well, everyone knows, we've, we've heard it from Dr. Bell, Dr. Toomey, Dr. Burks, Dr. Fauci. We've heard it from everyone on every side that we must be careful. And in the conversations we've had with those institutions, they are determined to be very careful, practice the social distancing. It's not going to be just like it used to be, at least not this year. It's going to be different, and there, there are some disappointments involved. But also, uh, th this particular class of 2020 is, uh, will take a place in history as being a very unusual uh, situation. But the, the smiles and the happiness that we're, we're seeing from some of the activities that have already taken place are, are heartwarming. And again, we'll, we'll get through it because we, ha we have confidence in the people of our state. They have good leadership. They have good understanding. And they uh, respect each other. And I, th I think we'll get through it just fine. Yes, ma'am. We talk about consumer confidence as well. Can you talk a little bit about the resources that are being given to some of these tourist attractions and these facilities that are now reopening or getting ready to reopen? Well, they all have the guidelines that are available on the DHEC website as, as well as, as the Accelerate SC website and all the links they have. But the, uh, the, the, the public officials in, in those counties and in those towns uh, also are on high alert and are very active in getting the information out about what the what the best practices are. Of course, law enforcement will be there if things get entirely out of hand. Uh, we hope that doesn't happen. But uh, th there's plenty plenty of guidance out from authoritative sources, and, and we feel confident things are going to work. Yes, ma'am. How do you think this reopening for Memorial Day weekend will affect the crowds and tourists coming for Memorial Day? Well. I expect that it, it may increase them, but also it'll give them more places to go. One of the recommendations of Accelerate SC was that uh, is the beaches are, are, are open now, but if the, only the beaches open, then the people that go to, the, to that area to, say, to Myrtle Beach will all be on the beach. But if these other things are open, then a lot of them will want to go there, and that's, even though there'll be more people coming in, there'll be more places for them to disperse to, more places for them to go. So in the end, it'll be good for the economy and good for the people as well. Governor. Yes, sir. Going off that, will there be a limit to capacity for these tourist attractions similar to what restaurants have to deal with? 
All of those, yes, those sorts of things are all limited in the, in the guidelines. It's different for every institution, and they ought to take a look. Now, those, of course, those are not, there's no sanction for not um, following those other than probably the great loss of business. As you heard from the Accelerate SC just, I think it was yesterday, uh, Mayor Knox White of Greenville, who was on, on the team, uh, they've developed a, a Greenville pledge where they have criteria that are set out and if a business or an activity or a venue wants to get the good housekeeping seal of approval, it's called Gr the Greenville Pledge sticker to put on their door, they have to agree to follow and to implement all of those recommendations and guidelines that are, that are, in, that are being published in, in, in this case in, in Greenville. That's a very good idea, and we would encourage people to, to do things like that. All the municipalities, very easy to do that, and uh, can use what they did in Greenville as an example. Yes, sir. Um, what's the plan in case case numbers go back up if we have spike? And do you trust residents to follow the social distance guidelines that Dr. Bell has repeatedly said over and over again? I do trust them, too. And... We have seen good compliance in South Carolina. That's one thing that has made the, the numbers that we've seen that are, there's still too many illnesses and too, certainly too many deaths. But we, we see that we're making, we're making uh, good progress. If the people, if they follow the guidelines, follow the advice and in this reopening and as the people move around and also with the intensive testing and tracking procedures that you've just heard about with 202 sites in South Carolina right now and counting where people can go get tested and then that test of course is sent to the lab and then they get the results and we've already got I think it's over a thousand people already already available to do the tracing to follow up with those who have tested positive if, if we if we stick together and we, we do what we've planned on doing we ought to be in good shape, and that's what we're counting on. Yes, ma'am. Um, Governor, you sent a letter yesterday to NUSC president on the $25 million sent by the legislature. Why did you feel the need to do that? Were you afraid that they would not be transparent? No, ma'am. We were making it very clear. This is a lot of money that's coming into our state, and every agency, every institution that receives this money is going to receive a, a letter uh, like that one because we are we have an inspector general as well uh, as part of the legislation the part of the cares act legislation there is a new inspector general a new federal inspector general it's going to be following up i can't remember how many millions of dollars they've given that brand new office and they say they'll be following up on these things for two or three years they say to be sure that the money is was spent where it was was supposed to be spent uh, we are we are in that uh, mode, we want to be sure that all of our people in our great state know that there will be a, an accounting, and we want them to know before they get the money that there's going to be a very tight uh, fiscal account accounting and, and not have to learn about it later. We want everybody to have the systems in place to be able to account for every penny when that question is asked. How important is it for everyone to be wearing a mask when they're out at businesses or in public on beaches? How important is that? Well, face coverings, masks, or those, those shields are, are, have been recommended by, by every authority. It all depends on the situation. If, if you're a farmer and you're in a field by yourself in the tractor, you probably don't need to wear one. But if, you, if you're inside, and particularly if you're around people, then that, that's, a different, that's a different story. But all those guidelines and recommendations have been made public and spoken here uh, hundreds of times. So it is important to take care of yourself. We cannot have an epidemic. Dr. Bell and Dr. Toomey and Chief Keel cannot follow everybody around, or Chief Hallbrook, to be sure that they're doing the best things for them. And your mama and your daddy might, might not be there either. But if you just do what your mama taught you way back then, is be careful with strangers and cover your cough and, and uh, your, your sneezes and wash your hands, we'll be in good shape. We call it, today in this context, we call it social distancing. Yes, sir. Actually, Dr. Bell, if you could address, you know, what are the differences, if any, in guidelines for masks indoors and outdoors? And should people be wearing them on the beach? 
The, um, as the governor said, the mask is needed if you're going to be in close contact with somebody. So if you're out on a beach and you're um, not in close contact with someone, then it, you don't need to wear a mask. If you're outside exercising or taking a run or something like that, then you don't need to wear a mask. But in any setting, whether it's inside or outside, if you're going to be in close proximity for um, a, a period of time m more than a matter of a few minutes, then it's recommended to wear a mask because you can't predict when you might encounter somebody who could be spreading the virus, who may not be having symptoms. So the mask is an extra measure of protection in addition to the recommendation to maintain social distancing. Dr. Bell, uh, can you talk about how well contact tracing is going, how successful has it been so far, and has DHEC identified any possible outbreaks or been able to stop any possible outbreaks because of the increased efforts with the contract tra contact tracing? Yeah, the contact tracing has been very successful. Um, contact tracing is a measure that we in public health use for a number of communicable disease conditions. We do contact tracing for um, you know, people who may have hepatitis or sexually transmitted diseases, uh, tuberculosis. So this is a measure that we employ all the time. And we have um, done this throughout this outbreak for every case of um, every reported case of COVID-19 that we could identify, that we could find, those individuals are interviewed and they're asked confidentially about who they might have come in close contact with. And then we follow up with those close contacts. We don't say in what setting they may have been exposed, but we provide recommendations to them about what they can do to monitor for symptoms and to prevent spread. And uh, so those measures have been very successful. Now the volume of cases that we will be looking at now, um, we're very fortunate to have a much larger workforce to help with that contact tracing and to continue those measures that we've had in place all along with a larger number of people. Um, illness onset, recently released data did show that our illness onset is now around February 12th. Are there earlier cases than we previously knew about from the onset of the first week of March that we originally knew about? By illness onset, you mean the first cases identified in the United States? In South Carolina. It's in now South showing Carolina? February 12th. Well, so something that, that has become evident with um, an analysis of, of how disease transmission occurred in the United States is that it's probably likely that cases were occurring before the cases were first confirmed by laboratory testing. And so um, we consider that that is also the possibility in South Carolina that early on with uh, subtle and vague symptoms of just a fever or muscle aches when people didn't know what to, um, weren't aware of COVID-19, uh, for mild illnesses for which they might not normally seek medical attention, the possibility is that there was some circulation of cases prior to the confirmed cases. But, but we do believe in South Carolina that for the most part, the first identified cases in a very concentrated community um, without additional evidence that there is there were significant other unidentified cases prior to what we first saw in Kershaw County, that we feel we have a pretty good handle on the start of the epidemic in South Carolina. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Fi final point, while we are lifting these restrictions and we'll lift others later and have lifted others before, I want to remind everybody that this is a dangerous, dangerous disease a dangerous virus and things that we may have done before for out of courtesy and, and good manners that were matters of, of courtesy and good manners are now actually matters of life and death. So you must follow these guidelines, pay attention and remember that although we are, we are lifting these regulations, lifting these restrictions, the, the, the virus is still here, is just as strong as it was at the beginning, and we must continue to be very careful and maintain that social distancing. Thank you very much.